afternoon, everybody. This is the, the second session, technical session of the CPGRAP 2021. It's about, uh, we are going to watch some presentations on computer vision, uh, papers related to computer vision. Uh, we have five papers, five nice papers here. Uh, please uh, submit your questions on YouTube, in the chat, and also in the Discord channel. The link for the Discord channel, it will be on the bottom of the, of the, the screen. So, the first paper we have today is called Gravity Alignment for Single Panorama Depth Inference. Hello, my name is Matheus Bergman, I am from Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul, and today I'm going to talk about gravity alignment for single panorama depth inference. Exploring depth from spherical media enables fully immersive navigation in augmented, mixed, and virtual reality. A really promising way of doing this is by capturing a single spherical image and then using it to infer its depth map. However, Many of the existing single panorama depth estimation methods present a considerable decrease in accuracy when the camera is tilted in the moment of the capture. In this paper, we present an approach to make existing single panorama depth estimation methods more robust. Our pipeline combines gravity alignment with depth estimation and can be used with any existing depth estimation method. When it goes to gravity alignment, earlier approaches were based on geometrical cues such as lines and vanishing points. Those methods usually work well on man-made ambience. Other approaches try to estimate the horizon lines and usually work well in natural scenes, but don't work well when the horizon line is occluded. More recently, deep learning based methods were used to create techniques that can be used in a generic capture scenario. One issue that is common in several gravity alignment methods is the circularity problem. It happens when two images are perceptually similar, but the angles are very different. The image below shows an example with rows of 5 and 355 degrees respectively, but with two images very similar to each other. In this paper, we propose a two-step approach composed of rotation estimation and gravity alignment, followed by depth inference. In our work, we focus on the upright adjustment part, since our method can be used with any monocular panorama depth estimation method. Our gravity alignment model, called Vector Up, is inspired by the Deep 360 up architecture. The main differences are that, instead of encoding the rotation by the pitch and raw angles, we output the three components of the normalized upright vector which fixes the circularity problem. Also, instead of using high-resolution images from the Sun360 dataset, which are no longer available, we had to use low-resolution images. To rotate the images, we generate n upright vectors on the surface of a sphere using a Fibonacci lattice. The result is shown in the image below. As dot augmentation, we perform blur and add Gaussian noise. We also modify the training protocol to achieve better and faster convergence when compared to Deep360 Up. In our train, we practice higher learning rates and use a learning rate scheduler. This reduces the training time by a factor of 4. It is known that rotating low resolution images generate artifacts that might compromise the resulting model. For the sake of comparison, we trained a model called Angles Up with the exact same architecture as Deep360 Up, but with the images at the available resolution. The images are rotated in this resolution and after that resized to the input size. As we've mentioned, our framework is suited for any single panorama depth estimation method. In this work, we tested our method using OmniDev. To evaluate our upright correction method, we adopt the angular error. As we can see, using vector up yields a more homogeneous error distribution. Here we can see some visual results. In the top we have the input image, in the middle the image rectified by vector up, and in the bottom the image rectified by angles up. Here we can see some popular metrics to evaluate the depth estimation. We can see that in the rotated dataset, 
vector up and angles up improve the home depth results. Even though the results for vector up and angles up are really similar to each other, vector up has more homogeneously distributed errors. Here we show some visual results with and without the rotation correction. Images are from left to right, input image, ground truth, omnidef, and omnidef when supplied with vector up. In this paper, we presented a rotation aware pipeline to estimate depth for a single panorama. Also, our main contributions on gravity alignment include a parameterization to mitigate the circularity problem, a way to generate angularly balanced images, and a model that produces homogeneous error distribution, and therefore does not compromise depth estimation when the input panorama is roughly aligned. Oof. Now we have the authors here. We have two of the authors. They are from the uh, Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul, uh, Matheus Bergman and Paulo Pinto. Uh, you can ask questions in the comments of YouTube, and also you can submit your questions on the Discord channel. So please, uh, you can submit your, your questions. Uh, so I have a first question for you. Uh, you use um, out-of-the-shelf method to estimate the depth of the scene, uh, but uh, most, uh, besides it, is you, you claim that it's a state of the art, but uh, when you change a little bit the scene, it doesn't work very well anymore. So, uh, how do you estimate the impact of the depth estimation in your pipeline? Um. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, what did, what do you mean by uh, changing the scene a little bit? You mean the rotation? No, no, not your scene. The these papers they test in one data set, and then when you apply the depth estimation in different data, it doesn't work as well as in the original data. So how does the the depth estimation affect may affect your method if it doesn't work well? Uh, uh, the uh, the depth estimation does not affect the the upright correction part. Is that what you are referring to, or the overall the overall or result. overall? Well, if, yeah. if the it will not improve a depth estimation uh, method that already does not work well in in any in, in any type of of spherical image, even aligned, even gravity aligned ones. Okay, so but uh, your method relies strongly on the estimation of the depth. Uh, uh, yes, we the main contribution in our method is in the upright correction part. Okay, we so, use uh, an out of the shell, uh, out of the shelf uh, method, and the upright correction part can be used for. Uh, any method, uh, any depth estimation method the, for spherical images. Have you evaluated the other techniques for this estimation or only that one you mentioned in, in the paper? Uh, uh, for depth estimation? You yes, mean? yes. Uh, in the paper, we have evaluated another technique called Bifuse. It is also a deep learning based depth estimation technique. Uh, however, we did not compute. Uh, we did not compute uh, 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 the the metrics, the depth estimation metrics for this method. Only we only present visual uh, examples because uh, the the weights provided do not work near the poles of the panorama. So it would be impossible to properly evaluate it uh, on rotated images. I have another question here is, so the, the idea is to perform a reconstruction in the end, you showed some results. So do you think you could use this technique out of the shelf that you proposed to real world applications or still need some um, work for, for that? For instance, I can get a three, 360 camera and reconstruct the, a bit, the inside part of a building or it's still far from, from that using your technique. Uh, 
uh, well, it is one of the state-of-the-art uh, depth estimation methods, and our 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 contribution, which is in the upright correction part, would not affect the would not make the, the results worse. So, uh, yes, you could use it in a real-world application. Okay, so it seems we don't have more questions here. So uh, I, I'd like to, to thank you for your paper and for answering the questions. Now we go to the next question. If you have more questions to this, to this paper, you can enter in the Discord channel and ask the authors there. Um, our second paper is from Federal University of Bahia. It's called Gazed Estimation via Self-Attention Augmented Convolutions. Hello everyone, my name is Gabriel de Fundes Vieira and today I'll be presenting the paper titled Gaze Estimation via Self-Attention Augmented Convolutions. This work was developed alongside Professor Luciano Oliveira at the iVision Research Lab at Universidade Federal de Bahia. Our main goal here was to explore if the recent trend of self-attention mechanisms could be applied successfully to gaze estimation. Conceptually, gaze estimation is the task of determining the direction of a subject's gaze, or in other words, their visual attention. In the context of our work, this will be achieved by obtaining a gaze vector g hat, whose origin is the middle point between the eyes and whose direction is described by the pitch and yaw angle components as illustrated in the presentation. As for the estimation task itself, our work focuses on appearance-based gaze estimation. Simply put, the objective is to extract the gaze vector information directly from images of the subject's eyes and or face. This is generally done by training some sort of learning algorithm to act as a mapping function between images and the gaze information. Our work focuses on improving the accuracy of said mapping function which in the context is a convolutional neural network, by augmenting it with self-attention. One of the main advantages in using self-attention mechanisms is their ability to model long-range contexts into features. On image applications, this translates to the model being able to learn correlations between relevant features in different regions of an image. So, our intuition here is simple. Gaze by itself is an inherently spatial phenomenon. For example, if we're looking at a picture of someone's face, the eyes are the obvious indicators of where that person is looking. But other regions like the nose, the chin and the ears are also all strong predictors for the gaze direction. So being able to take them all into account together should produce better results than just taking hints from them separately. As a baseline, we use a regular ResNet 18 architecture with one input stem and four convolutional blocks. From there, to integrate attention in the model, we're going to use self-attention augmented convolutions as drop-in replacements for all the convolutional layers in the core convolutional blocks. We keep the input stem as a regular convolution and keep the same gap layer on the output. Training these attention augmented convolutions is a very resource-heavy process, so due to the hardware constraints, we also remove the last convolutional block entirely. We're then left with 14 convolutional layers, and we'll refer to this architecture as ARIS-14 for the remainder of the presentation. For more details on the attention augmented convolution layers themselves, please refer to the full paper. Now, building upon the ARIS-14 architecture, we present our final gaze estimation framework, a multi-input, dual-branch architecture dubbed ARIS-GAZE. We use as input image from the subject's face and the subject's size. These are then passed through two separate ARIS-14 branches in parallel, and the extracted features are then joined by concatenation and mixed by sequential fully connected layers to produce the final output, which are the pitch and yaw gaze angles. For the experiments, we use the MPI phase gaze and IDIAP datasets, which are two of the most widely used datasets for in the wild appearance based gaze estimation evaluations. We evaluated the effect of self attention in each branch of the ARIS gaze framework by comparing the average angular error on both datasets. The face branch of the framework benefited more on average from the use of self-attention than the eye branch, and this aligns with our hypothesis, since on the face input there is relevant information in multiple regions of the image, while on the eyes the gaze relevant information is usually condensed to one region, the pupil. On both datasets, the use of self-attention on both branches simultaneously yielded the best results overall.
Finally, we compare our approach with comparable methods in the current state of the art. Um, we are able to reach the best results with the Ares Gaze framework on one dataset, MPI Face Gaze, while reaching second place by a slight margin on the IDIAP datasets. Given the shallowness of the attention augmented backbone, Ares 14, this result further reinforces the notion that self attention is a very promising avenue to explore with regards to appearance based gaze estimation. In conclusion, we were able to ascertain that the use of self-attention was indeed beneficial to the appearance-based gaze estimation task, having been able to obtain comparable results with the current state of the art. We showed that facial images have more to gain from the use of self-attention than eye images, which leads us to believe that a framework with specialized architectures for each input might perform as well or even better while having less training overhead. Additionally, using other modalities of inputs like facial landmarks might improve the results or even open the way for other tasks like jointly predicting head pose and gaze by leveraging these spatially aware facial features. Thank you, and please don't hesitate to reach out with any questions you might have. Thank you. Now we have Gabriel here. Uh, you can send your, your questions through YouTube uh, comments or through the Discord channel that has the hashtag here. Uh, we have one, one first question uh, from Antonio Carlos. Do you consider merging the images and using only one network for the same task? If, if why not do it as it would be less parameters? fewer parameters uh yeah um yeah for um, first you would be of course less parameters like half the parameters overall but following the the state of the art over the, the past uh, maybe five to ten years where people started using cnns for appearance based gaze estimation there was a big jump in accuracy when people started using both the face images and the eye images and the, the rationale is because um, using full face images, you can get a lot of context because in, independently of where I'm looking at with my eyes, if I'm turning my head sideways, that changes the, the gaze point a lot. But um, if you only focus on that, you'll lose a lot of um, fine grain accuracy with regards to the eye images. So the networks were not able to properly uh, learn the intricacies of using only you know only one image or stacking the, the the images to make the parameters learn when to look at the face and when to look at the eyes. Um, the, for the past few years in the literature, all the best results are when you are able to look at them separately and then join the features at the end. Thank you. Uh, so you you mentioned that you're joint features in the end, so looking at the eyes and the face separately. Uh, how about the eyes? Do you detect the eyes or do you have a notation on the eyes from the data set? How do you do that? Yeah, for the experiments uh, we ran on the paper, the data sets came with uh, annotations for facial landmarks. So we use those to uh, both normalize the facial images and to extract the eye patches. But on a real-world application, you would, uh, of course, need some other method before the, the gaze estimation step to localize the, the eyes. Uh, you also mentioned, and you mentioned in the paper that you use the MPI face gaze data set. Uh, it has subjects with wearing, wearing glasses, uh, but the results are just uh, one set of results. Do you? Do, do you, did you evaluate the impact of glasses in the gaze estimation, or you didn't do that using this? Yeah, data? since uh, since we we ran, you know, leave one out cross validation, we had separate results for each subject, but I did we didn't think it was um, statistically relevant since we only had one. I, I guess only one, maybe two at the most subjects between fifteen. Uh, that were wearing glasses, and there was not a clear uh, relationship between the glasses and not wearing glasses, where we would were comfortable in saying, you know, this difference is because of the glasses. 
having a wider range of identities, sure, that would be a valid experiment. I see. And uh, also, just a curiosity, you mentioned that in your network is only 14 layers. Uh, to, I, I know that you got the original network and removed some layers and resulted in 14. Uh, have you evaluated that more or less than that? For example, 13, 12 or 16, just or just stuck with 14? Yeah, no, we, our original plan was to use ResNet 18 uh, as, as it was, because it's a very widely known uh, neural network. And our objective was to explore more the impact of self-attention than the depth of uh, the network itself. So we couldn't use 18 because it was very uh, resource heavy and we couldn't train it properly. So we got it down to 14. The, was a good trade-off between training time and complexity, but we didn't uh, further evaluate with other depths because it was slightly out of the scope of this, this paper. Okay, thank you, Gabriel. I don't think we have more questions. If you have more questions, you can ask directly Gabriel in the Discord channel um, and discuss with him. Thank you. Thank you. Now we go to the third uh, paper of this session. Is one investigation of 2D key points detection on challenging scenarios using depth-wise separable convolutions, a hand pose estimation case study. It's a work from uh, University uh, Universidade Federal de, de Pernambuco. Hello. My name is William Costa, and I am a researcher at Voxa Labs. I will now present a research paper entitled An Investigation of 2D Key Points Detection on Challenging Scenarios Using Deathwise Separable Convolutions, a hand post estimation case study. This research was performed together with Lucas Figueiredo, João Marcelo Teixeira, João Paulo Lima, and Veronica Tarib. As expected, we tackle the task of 2D key points detection, in which, given an image or a frame of a video as input, we aim to estimate the 2D locations of important features in the image. For human-computer interaction, this task may be generalizable in multiple contexts, such as hand pose estimation, body pose estimation, and facial and max detection. Convolutional neural networks have been extensively applied to extract features from images and, in particular, to detect 2D key points. However, models based on CNNs are often computationally costly, requiring high-end GPUs to achieve interactive frame rates. Besides, deep CNNs often output redundant feature maps, increasing the overall computation cost, processing features that might not be useful at all. In this sense, therefore, separable convolutions may be used to accelerate inference time and to select more descriptive output features. In an experiment performed by Sifrin Mala in the PhD thesis, they swapped the first two conv convolutional layers of a model proposed by Zeiler and Fergus for the task of image, image recognition with therefore separable convolutions. And we can notice that the reduction of training parameters allows efficient models to be executed in mid-end GPUs or embedded devices. However, reducing the number of trainable parameters may prejudice the overall course of the system and may be especially prejudicial for systems that are extensively used for tracking purposes, in which native challenges are expected, such as loss of focus, motion blur, and occlusions. In this work, We explore the usage of deathwise separable convolutions for 2D key points detection in the context of hand pose estimation, focusing on challenging scenarios for the task. Our main contributions are an optimized architecture for 2D hand pose estimation with an improvement of 12.8% on average for inference time, keeping the loss of accuracy for under one pixel. An augmented version of the stereo benchmark dataset, which is a dataset for the task of 2D hand pose estimation with an augmentation strategy comprising simulated challenging scenarios and an analysis of the impacts for each challenging scenario on dense models against the five models. We base our research on the PoseNet model proposed by Zimmerman and Brox 
to detect 2D key points given an RGB image as input. This is a simple, straightforward architecture based on convolutional blocks and pooling layers. We chose this specific network since many approaches that are directly based or follow the same baseline SpoolsNet have been extensively applied on the literature for the task of hand pose estimation. Also, since SpoolsNet is directly inspired by the convolutional pose machines model, many other models are also relatable to PoseNet, such as open pose for the task of body key points detection. Our proposed architecture proposed optimization is then achieved by swapping the dense convolutional layers for deathwise convolutional layers followed by relu activations. And the first 15 convolutional layers have their weight preloaded from the convolutional pose machines model, so they are not swapped. We use two datasets for this evaluation. The first is the render and pose dataset, which is comprised of synthetic images, and then we fine-tune the weights using a dataset of real human hands. We divide them in train and evaluation splits, and for S train, for the training and validation datasets for the shared benchmark dataset, we propose an augmented dataset which is, we call S train star and S val star. A quantitative results on SVAL indicates that although we do have a loss of accuracy when swapping for the depthwise, this loss is under one pixel and we are able to achieve much better inference time. Qualitatively, we can see that there is not much difference in the results since they are directly relatable. Thank you very much for your attention. Now we have here Williams Costa from Federal University of Pernambuco to answer questions. We have five minutes of questions. Uh, you can submit your questions in the Discord channel and also in the YouTube, in the comments of the YouTube channel that is transmitting this, this presentation, this session. Uh, so for the starters, um, so you, you you, the goal here is to use separable convolutions to speed up the, the process, uh, to reduce the computational cost. And you, you mentioned some improvements on, on the computational costs, uh, but you, you did more experiments on more challenging data, like blur, uh, motion blur data, the focused lens, uh, the, your evaluation regarding the computational cost is uh, considering the entire experiments or it's a, a part of the experiments? Thank you for your question. Our average inference time was sped up in 12.8% and this is on all of the experiments. So if you are training using a motion blur scenario, you also have a 12.8% speed up in average for inference time against the model using only the dense or common convolutional layers. Uh, in the results, you, you show the numbers for the minimum time and the average time how about the standard deviation? Have you computed, computed that to, to see how, how much it varies? No, we did not compute the standard deviation because these, the, the inference time is actually calculated on, uh, on different runs, but not on various runs. So we have the test, the test procedure. So we take these images, we process these images, and then we just calculated the difference between the time in the beginning and the time in the end. So we did not take the same deviation or, or the statistical analysis because we did not consider that in this case, we this would be any, this would lead us to any further insights on how this well was, how well the model was behaving. I see, so it was, for different data, so different data, okay. And also you, you mentioned, you, you show there the, the reduction in the number of parameters, uh, um, almost 10 times or something like that, 90% 90, 90 of reduction. Um, that's in the numbers of trainable parameters. Have you computed the, or estimated the reduction on flops, on floating point operations as well? 
No, we did not estimate the reduction in flops, but I think this would be a great investigation and follow-up work. Okay, I think it's a it's a, a nice measurement because it doesn't it doesn't depend on the actual time, uh, but it's the number of operations. So I think it's a nice measure. And uh, another thing, you you uh, the case studies for hand pose estimation. Do you have an application in mind, or you just playing with this problem without a application target. Yeah. We actually have a few applications in mind. The first is for general human computer interaction. So to allow gestures on computers that have mid end GPUs. So if you are following a dense approach, you, know, you, ha you have a lot of convolutional layers, this will not be able to execute in real time. But if you do use the DevOps approach convolutions, then you might be able to execute them in real time. And the second idea in mind is to work with uh, virtual reality, in which we have the, the the camera. And since we are already processing a lot of, of visual information, of graphic information, and the GPU is already very busy trying to process this, we are also throwing in a lot of QDA operations. So we have to make this the more lightweight as possible. I see. Have you tried, last question, have you tried to to run this uh, outside of a GPU, for instance, a small device, uh, Raspberry Pi, because you reduced the number of parameters a lot, so you save memory. So have you tried or are you planning to try on small devices? Yeah, we have only trained uh, try to calculate inference time using CPU, but we did not took these, these measurements into the, the research paper because although it, it is very re reduced, it's still not near close to be run in real time. Oh, okay. Okay, so we don't have further questions. Thank you, Williams, for, you for re re replying, the, the, for answering the questions. If you have more questions uh, regarding this paper, you can contact the author in the Discord channel you can ask questions there. Thank you. Now we go to the fourth paper of this session. It's from Federal University of Rio Grande. It's entitled Fast Spatial Temporal Transformer Network. In this presentation, we introduce the Fast Spatial Temporal Transformer Network a deep network for video painting. In computer vision, paint is a process or technique of restoring a missing or damaged part of an image, or removing an object or watermark from an image. The painting process applied to videos is currently a big challenge, because additional information must be extracted from neighboring frames, which elevates significantly the computational cost of the painting process. Recent video painting works rely on the use of the transformer architecture. Despite all of them achieving state-of-the-art results, we could only find these three works in the literature, the STTN, the DSTT, and the Fuse former. The transformer is a neural network consisting of attention mechanisms. It has been used in several works achieving state-of-the-art in many different areas of deep learning. In an attention mechanism, representations of the network's input are calculated, the query, key, and value matrices. This formula summarizes the attention process, where we perform the softmax of the normalized multiplication of the query and the transposed key matrices, and then we multiply the obtained score with the value matrix. In practice, the attention calculates the relevance a single piece of information has with all other pieces. However, the transformer has two major problems. The first is that the complexity of the transformer is quadratic, and the second problem is that the layers activations occupy too much memory. These activations are the inputs and outputs of each attention layer that are stored on the memory and that are used during backpropagation for gradient computation. The STTN, mentioned before, is the first to explore the transformer architecture to tackle video painting applications. Because it inherits the transformer's problems and also extracts information from multiple frames of a video, its use requires sophisticated equipment. To solve these problems, we propose the fast STTN, 
that is a deep network for viewing painting. It is heavily based on the STTN, but solves its high memory consumption problem by implementing the reversible layers method into the transformers blocks of the network. This strategy allows for a reduction in memory usage by up to 7 times, and a 2.2 times faster execution time approximately. The reversible layers is a method that eliminates the need to store the layers activation in memory. In this method, the activations are deleted from memory and are retrieved on demand during backpropagation. This is the overall architecture of the fast STTN. Similar to the STTN, T frames and binary masks enter the network going through an encoder, A transformer blocks, and A decoder. The reversible layers method is applied directly to the transformers blocks. With a GPU with 16 GB of memory, this table shows the memory consumption and FPS at the inference of the STTN and the past STTN models. A sequence of not more than 13 frames could fit in the GPU with the STTN, while with the fast STTN, a total of 123 frames could fit in the GPU. This table shows the quantitative evaluation of both models in function of the metrics PSNR, SSIM, and EWAR. As you can see, all methods present similar results in terms of accuracy. This is a qualitative comparison of both models. The first row shows frame samples from frame sequences that went through the models. The second row shows the respective masks of the frames of the first row. The third row shows the impainted frames by the fast STTN. The fourth row shows the impainted frames by the STTN. We propose in this work the FAST STTN, a state-of-the-art video painting network that has in its core transformer blocks that were modified in order to reduce its memory and time consumption of execution. We conclude that there is no quality loss in exchange for reducing memory consumption and increased speed. Thank you. You. Now we have time for questions. We have here two authors, Rodrigo uh, de Bain and Rafael Escher. You can post your questions on the YouTube uh, comments and also in the Discord channel. That is the hashtag is here and on the bottom of the the page, uh, the, the screen. So um, you you try to increase the number of frames that the GPU can hold but it, as you mentioned you showed in the table as you keep adding new more frames the FPS reduces so do, do, did you find a optimal number of frames to, to add in the GPU simultaneously uh, well it didn't it doesn't matter how many frames uh, the speed won't uh, it's linear the time like if at, at 10 frames you would have uh, let me see uh, 10 frames will to process at 30 33 frames per second and with double you you have uh, two times faster it, it doesn't have an optimal fps it's, it's linear but in the in the table you show that if you add uh, I don't know 100 frames the FPS is reduced or I mistaken. Yeah. Oh yes yes it is reduced because it depends on, on the memory. Uh, like uh, 10 frames occupies almost two gigabytes of GPU memory, and uh, 123 frames occupies 15 gigabytes of memory. And the FPS depends on the memory. That depends on the number of frames that enters the GPU. I see. Thank you. We have a question from Claudio Jung. Uh, for video in painting, it is important to evaluate if the final results present some kind of flickering. Have you evaluated that visually? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, the, the goal of our, our work was to compare, uh, it was to, to get a state-of-the-art network, which is the STTN, 
uh, and to and try to reduce uh, its complexity. The ST10 it presents uh, the, some kind of flickering and sometimes some art artifacts in the results, and uh, the, these artifacts they are present also in the in our model. They don't change. Uh, we try to to show that uh, we we manage to, to speed up the, the frames that we the, the speed of the frames that we process in the network, and we don't without. Um, Without having quality loss, we don't have a quality loss. Uh, why we have a faster network? Also, the, the quality is not better. It's the same. So, if the STN has some flickerings or artifacts, our model also has those problems. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. It's more a curiosity because it is it's not exactly my research area. So in the results, you show a PSNR of 19. Almost all the methods get uh, got 19. That's a, I mean, if you do some video compression or image compression, this is a very low result. Why is that? You, because you're comparing a, a, the original image with a image with in painting that you don't have a ground truth? Why is the... PSNR is so low. Uh, well, the, the, the evaluation we did was with the entire video. Uh, for instance, the videos, the videos are 80 to 100 frames in average. Uh, it has a lot of uh, student move, movements. And uh, the evaluation was with all the frames, not some selected frames. Uh, but the, the the results in the present by the STTN, we show here that it has also 19, but in the original paper, it has, a, I, I think it's 25, 28. The method we use it, it presented uh, less, less uh, worst uh, results, but it is it was because of the method we use it. It would, uh, with normal methods, it would be higher. The PSNR and the SSIM results. Okay, thank you. I'm not criticizing your method. I know that your result is it will be the same as the original method. Just mm -hmm. a curiosity about the 19, which is no slow. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, I think we don't have further questions. Uh, if you, uh, thank you, Rafael Rodrigo, for the, answering the questions. And uh, you. if you want to talk to the authors, please go to the Discord channel and you can ask more questions there. Thank you. Now we have the uh, last but not least paper on the list presentation on the, the session. The fifth paper is from University Federal University of Minas Gerais, analyzing the effects of dimensionality reduction for unsupervised domain adaptation. I think I know this thing. Hello, I'm Renato from the Federal University of Minas Gerais, and this is a presentation of the work analyzing the effects of dimensionality reduction for supervised domain adaptation. To start off, Deep neural networks are extensively used to solve a variety of computer vision tasks due to the remarkable results achieved with these models. In image classification, the network must correctly classify images based on what is portrayed by them. A large amount of data is needed to train this network. However, creating a large labeled data set is very time and resource consuming, as a human has to manually label the instances. A solution may be to use data from a different but semantically related source domain that is already available and labeled thus escaping the labeling cost. However, this leads to another problem, as there will be a shift in the data distribution between the domains, caused by differences in image conditions. Due to this domain shift, the traditional methods used for training the neural networks do not lead to great results, so domain adaptation methods will adapt to this training procedure in order to diminish the negative effects of the domain shift. In this work, we focus on the homogeneous and the supervised scenario, where the domains share the same classes and only unlabeled data are available in the target domain. Our work is mainly based on the two adversarial domain adaptation methods, the first one being the domain adversarial neural network, 
where a domain classification test do two classified sample based on the domain they are part of is added to the network. This task is trained at the reverse area, using a gradient reversal layer, which will encourage domain variance. The second one is the robust spherical domain adaptation that builds upon the previous method by incorporating the concept of pseudo labeling, that is automatically assigning label to the target and labeled samples. In our SDA, the authors propose a robust pseudo labeling based formulation based on the confidence of the pseudo label being correct. This confidence is obtained using Gaussian uniform mixture models based on the distance between each sample's feature vector and the class android in a spherical feature space. We propose two modifications to the RSDA pipeline, with the goal to improve the performance on target data. In the original RSDA method, only pseudo-labeled data from the target domain were used in the EM algorithm to estimate the mixture parameters. As the pseudo-labels may be incorrect, especially in the early stages of the training, this may lead to a loss of concept problem if enough target samples are incorrectly labeled. This will severely impact the model's classification performance. So, we propose using both the source labeled data and the target pseudo labeled data during this estimation, as the source ground truth labels will serve as anchors to the class definitions, avoiding the loss of concept problem. We also propose applying the dimensionality reduction method to the produced features before calculating the distances relative to the class and points that are used during the parameters estimation. This is based on a hypothesis that adaptation is easier in a space with fewer dimensions, as semantically related information is privileged over image conditions related information. As in a homogeneous setting, the divergence between the source and target domains is mainly characterized by difference in image conditions. We suppose that, by reducing the dimensionality of the features, we should obtain better results on the target domain data. Our proposed pipeline for estimating the Gaussian for mixture parameters is summarized in this figure. We conduct the experiments with two commonly used datasets in domain adaptation, Office 31 and Office Home. We follow the same configuration defined as in the original RCA paper, with the ResNet 50 with weights pre-trained on the ImageNet as a feature extract. For the dimensionality reduction step, we experiment with two algorithms, PCA and PLS. In this table, we present the results achieved with the Office 31 dataset, with different source target pairs. Notice how the results achieved on the target domain are considerably improved when we add the modifications to the original RCA method suggesting that the hypothesis on which the modifications are based hold true. In this table, we have the results on the Office Home dataset. Notice that, as this dataset is much more challenging due to the amount of images and the level of divergence between the domains, even the original methods do not achieve high classification increases on target data. Nevertheless, our proposed modifications also led to an improvement in the results in most cases. So, in conclusion, our proposed modifications should the robust spherical domain adaptation method in fact, it led to better results on the target domain data in most scenarios, demonstrating that the changes contributed to a greater adaptation. Furthermore, our results and conclusions can certainly guide future works on the domain adaptation area, providing possible paths that could lead to an even more robust adaptation. Thank you. Now we have Renato Lopes Jr. here to answer. Uh, questions. It's from Federal University of Minas Gerais. You, as you know, you can send your questions through the YouTube uh, comments and also through the Discord channel. And then um, Renato can answer. We have one, one question from Cloud Young. Uh, do you think that the target number of features relates to the complexity? or number of classes of the data sets. Thank you, Claudio, for your question. Yes, we should achieve a balance between the complexity of the data set, of the classification task that we should perform on the data, and the invariability between the domains. So we have to select a number of features that so that the, the model, the classification model, is able to correctly classify the images due to the, the amount of classes that is available, and that we reduce it based on our, our hypothesis, so that it makes it easier for, to transfer this knowledge from the source domain into the target domain. So we, it relates, okay? So we, when we have a more complex classification task at hand, we should need 
more features so we can correctly classify the images. Thank you, Renat. Um, well, uh, I have a question. Uh, you, you're using a classifier with pseudo labels in the target domain. Um, what is the impact in the estimation of the EM parameters if the pseudo labels are incorrect? So that's the main point of using the robust pseudo label loss. Because we use the EM algorithm so we can estimate this is on the original word. This, so they can estimate the probability of a label being correctly labeled. We propose using data from both the target domain and the source domain to make this estimation of these parameters of the Gaussian uniform mixture per, uh, models so that it's more, it's more robust this probability assignment to the pseudo label data from the target domain. So we can further decrease the negative effects of this wrongly labeled target data. Thank you. We have a follow-up. We have a follow-up question from Claudio. And what is your suggestion for setting the target feature space? Oh yes. I think you are asking about how many dimensionalities we use to estimate the mixture parameters with the expectation maximization algorithm. So we make experiments with two dimensionality reduction algorithms, the PLS and PCA. For PCA, we use the standard procedure to reduce the dimensionality until a threshold of 95% of explained variance is met. And for PLS, we experiment with, we, we, yes, we experiment with very different values for this number of components that is returned after, after the dimensionality reduction step. And we find we found that the number 10, like 10 reduce the dimensionality of the feature vector to 10 dimensions was the best trade-off between the feature variance between the domains and the model ability to classify the instances in the original class labels on the original classification task that we want to, that's the main goal here, to classify the images in this classification task. Thank you. Uh, I have one question here is, you're employing in a homogeneous domain adaptation. Do you think you could ex uh, it would be easy to extend this to a heterogeneous domain adaptation? Or since the classes are different, you wouldn't be able to do that? Yes, we would need you know, change this homogeneous model to a heterogeneous one, where the classes may be different between the domains. Even the amount of classes or the inclusion of different more classes with different semantic meaning so we would need to completely rethink the method so we can extract this knowledge from source but it may not be present a class may not be present for the sort domain so it's not easy to change a homogeneous method like ours and the one we put upon the rsda one to a heterogeneous setting that uh, is very more challenging due to this difference right this great level of diversity between the cement mean of the classes and even the amount of classes between the domains. Thank you, Renat, for your answers. I don't think we have further questions. Thank you for your answers and for your presentation. Um, this was the, the last uh, presentation of this technical session, the second technical session regarding computer vision. Uh, if you want to uh, continue our discussion with the authors, you can enter in the Discord channel and ask questions or chat with the authors. And also, I would like to invite you to our keynote, the number two, uh, Hugo Proença, that will start at three. You can see through the schedule the, the link. Uh, please attend this talk. It's a very, very nice talk. And thank you, everybody, everyone, to attending this section.